I'm Brooks County Commissioner Christian Leinbach, and I want to welcome you to our first on the commission meeting here in the Borough of Watson and in the meeting room for the Watson Public Library. Uh, this meeting is uh, on September the 16th. We are broadcasting live by Microsoft Teams live event, BCTV as well as Facebook and YouTube Live. I wanted to note uh, for those watching uh, and those that are here, uh, some uh, basic notes. One, the bathrooms are in, and this is not the people that aren't here. I just want to, we do have bathrooms, but uh, the bathrooms are in the back, uh, just around the corner. And when you leave, you'll exit out this, uh, don't go out the door, came in, exit out uh, the other door. As I noted, this is our first time uh, doing a Commissioners on the Road. I want to thank our audience team. Uh, they did a lot of work uh, putting the technology together for this program. I also want to recognize Commissioner Kevin Bart. It was initially his idea. It's something that he uh, took a look at down in Lancaster County if they're on the road. And when he brought it to the Board of Commissioners, we wholeheartedly endorsed it. So uh, work with us. We're going to begin now by recognizing my executive assistant, Mary Buer, uh, to uh, give her co the comment uh, information. Public comment will be accepted in person and through the Q&A function. Please include your first name, last name, and municipality for all comments. Any comments without name and municipality will not be considered. A citizen can submit one comment. Comment length is dictated by the limitations of the platform being used. Teams Q&A, Facebook, or YouTube. In-person comments will be accepted first, followed by comments submitted virtually. The meeting comment period is limited to a total of 30 minutes, including both in-person and virtual comments. This time period may be extended at the discretion of the board. Please be concise. Comments that are germane to county business will be read during the meeting and should not be considered to be interactive dialogue with the commissioners. The county's solicitor shall be the final arbiter of whether a comment is germane and should be read. Any commissioner response to public comment will be done at the discretion of the commissioners. Thank you very much, Mary. At this time, I would ask everyone to please stand with us for a moment of silence, followed by a pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll stop you by. Yeah. At this time, I'd like to recognize Fred Levering. Uh, Fred is uh, well known here in the Y Missing area, the mayor of Y Missing. And uh, he's asking uh, one of the, the president of council, I guess, uh, to come up with him. I'm going to recognize Fred are you going first or is John? John. I'll recognize John. If you would uh, please step up. Uh, we do appreciate you hosting us. And as our host, it's an opportunity uh, for uh, you and uh, the mayor to share with us. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that coming here to our borough and uh, it's very nice. I like like we're the first ones. I have a conflict and need to leave as soon as I'm done, but I'll entertain any questions you might have that you need to know. So I'm chairman of the Planning Commission and chairman of the Economic Development Committee. Now when Fred was president of council, he formed the Economic Development Committee and I think it's been a very valuable tool for Council. Um, it's been about 10 years, Fred, but maybe more. 
I don't know. Um, so we have some, I'm going to start out with the buzzkill part of the uh, presentation. There's some properties in the borough we're concerned about, but uh, I don't want to go into that, but I will talk about one of them, which is the uh, Berkshire Mall. Now the Berkshire Mall, Michelle and myself and uh, Chris Hartman, our solicitor, met with the attorney for the Berkshire Mall last summer, and it's their intent to fill up the two anchor stores before they fill in the gaps, because if fill in the gaps, it doesn't work for them. They said all the right things, we'll see what happens, because some of us are very concerned about it. Um, let's get to what happened in Vienna. Um, Equus Capital Partners, we had a meeting with them, and my council types have heard this story many times, but they came and made a presentation to council and the Economic Development Committee, and uh, when, with it, when the two guys left from Equus, George Haynes and uh, Kevin Flannery, somebody were all looking at each other, and somebody said, John, what do you think? I said, I think I want to do a cartwheel. You know, it's just, it's there the real, you know how government works. You know, our planning commission is Monday of the month, the council meeting the second Tuesday of the month, economic development support Thursday. To expedite them, we would have joint planning commission and council meetings just to move right along. Um, so they sec secured uh, UGI Energy as their anchor there on the south side of the tracks. And they got Reading Orthopedics. Um, they also have, uh, they got Teleflex and Ducom, a Drexel University College of Medicine. So when they proposed having a Wawa there, 10 Avenue and Park Road, I went to the zoning hearing meeting and um, there were four people there who were opposed to it. And this was in Philadelphia Inquirer like this past Sunday, why Wawa's aren't welcome. And this is kind of more in, in a residential neighborhood, which doesn't really apply. So I called them all up the next day, three of them that I knew, and I said, hey, you don't get it. We could have a Dollar General there. I said, I'll take the Wawa. So it's there. Next. So once Drexel came and Teleflex came, and there's two more pad sites there on the north side of uh, uh, the railroad track tracks, Count realized we needed to do something to alleviate the traffic on Park Road because it was tough in the first place. And the, uh, the College of uh, Medicine opened up in late August, I think, said, we got to get this done. So we, with the help of Judy Schwank, Senator Judy Schwank and uh, Representative Mark Gillen, we had, we have uh, lobbyists and we get up, go up to uh, Harrisburg and they opened the doors for us and uh, we met with the Secretary of DCED, the Secretary of PennDOT, the governor's chief of staff when he was sitting with through open doors 10 feet away uh, and uh, the ranking Democrat on the uh, transportation committee. This, so now we got the 4th Street innovative way to 4th Street to North Wyomissing Boulevard. It's not a Wyomissing project. I think it's a regional project because these people, I had a meeting with um, the other day I'm in the Wyoming Foundation West Trading Task Force, and uh, there's people coming here from Seattle. You know, it, it's crazy, but uh, that's where they're coming. So, anyway, the lobbyists, you know, Michelle and I would go on a two and a half hour round trip to have a 20 minute meeting with some of these people I just mentioned. So, it, it worked, but uh, anyway. Let's see what else we have here. Yeah, and then these people didn't want to just see our hired guns, the uh, lobbyists. They wanted to see an elected official. So, which 
I don't blame them. But uh, and what we had, which was going for us, is we had drawings and plans that we could show these people. Here's what we want to do, and here's why we want to do it. And that almost every one of them said, at this stage, and we don't see plans like this. I said, well, we're serious about it. We this got to get done. So it did get done. Yeah, and yeah, I can't say how much I uh, appreciate what Judy and Mark did for us at the uh, um, in Harrisburg. Anyway, what we've done is we've changed some zoning overlay districts to allow over five residents at the Crown Plaza. The, the Crown Plaza pre-COVID was only at a 40% occupancy and it's not sustainable. So there's going to be over 55 residences there. We changed it. We changed the overlay district at Berkshire Heights and at the corner of Penn Avenue and Park Road Corridor. I'm also on the, so we're kind of in sync. I'm on the West Stratton Economic Development Committee as well. And a good friend of mine, Phil Wart, in charge of that. He's a council person there. And uh, it's just nice that we know what each other is doing. It just makes perfect sense. Anyway, in conclusion, um, I could talk forever about this, but anyway, the borough of Wyoming missing with 11,000 residents has seen over a quarter of a billion dollars in private investments in the last five years. And it's it's great for our other residents because when the, the commercial res or commercial areas are paying more taxes, it keeps the taxes down for our residents. And uh, that's all I have. If you have any questions for me, I'd be glad to answer them. And if you don't, that's okay. All the, all the buildings spoken for at the uh, that Equus has under their responsibility, there's still more that are vacant. There's two pad sites on the north side of the tracks for telephone school uh, that are not spoken for, but everything else is uh, is full. And we're getting. I, I forgot to mention. We're more than likely getting a grocery store at 8th and Hill Avenue, right on the board of West Reading and why I'm missing. And we've been talking about that mostly at West Reading for years and years and years. And I think it'll be a home run. I mean, I just think it's kind of a no brainer. We tried to get, we did try, but uh, Ed was uh, tried to get Trader Joe's. And he said the market wasn't there. This is places called <clears throat> Kimberton Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. Whole Foods. It's a little chain, not not that little, but so I wish them the best. I think they'll knock them dead there. So yeah. anyway, that's my economic development story here. I just can't. I've invited other municipalities to our economic development committee meetings and said, hey. You want to do it, and I don't want to mention any names. But some places that are developed, that developed, it's just all in their lap. Well, it's not all in their laps anymore. You know, they got to get on top of it. But so John, just to touch on Equus, you use the term "they're the real deal." Um, I met with Equus at the very beginning. Before it was really public. They came to my office. They showed me the the drawings and their vision. Uh, I actually talked to George Haynes and Kevin Flannery today, and one of the things I told them, in all my 14 years, I've never seen a developer come in, present a vision, and then go out and do it. And do it in an amazing system with what they told us with what they told the borough they were going to do. Uh, I use that in stark contrast to the whole development company and Fairground Square Mall. And I can say that because they also, and I believe maybe a year prior, came and met with me in my office. Same thing, showed me all the plans. They got through all the plans and they wanted money. And I had more conversations with Muhlenberg Township 
and they had to pull them kicking and screaming to get them to go part way. They're nowhere close to what they put out as their plan. So I, I really believe you are correct. Why am missing? And our region uh, are very fortunate to have a developer that actually does what they say they're going to do. And if anything, it was done more quickly than we could have ever imagined. Part of that is uh, to the credit of why missing Borough, uh, to a certain degree, West Reading, because there's a, a connection there. But it is the most incredible development project I've seen. And I believe it may be, in my 14 years, the most consequential. Well, you know, George Haynes from Equus, you know, I got to know him pretty well and so did Michelle, but uh, he said, or thought he was crazy when he said about coming to Redmond. Mm -hmm. Look at me at well, I don't think he's crazy anymore. No. Anyway, just, we just our stance was before they, you know, if they don't disappoint us, let's just get out of the way. Mm -hmm. you know? That's what we did. Very good. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Just as another thing that has nothing to do with anything, in the same Philadelphia Inquirer on Sunday, there's an article of Mike Drago, the sports writer oh, yeah. in Eagle. Well, he's in, re embedded himself and he's got an online portal because he just got tired of working there. There mm -hmm. used to be, I don't know, 20 people working there and it was down to four. And, Aaron can appreciate that. Yeah. So oh, that's good to know. Thank you. Fred, Mr. Mann. <clears throat> oh, let's not be so Thank you. Um, I certainly echo John's comments about welcoming you. We're very proud to have you here. Don't be strange, hope to have you back again. Um, we can't lose sight of the fact that really the reason that we in municipal government exist is to protect and promote our residential areas. Um, it's all about families and having a safe and, and productive place to work, play, raise your families, um, have a lot of conveniences, uh, good schools, and so on. So uh, we concentrate on the residential, but as John very aptly put it, the commercial development helps pay those bills. And so that makes it extraordinarily important, particularly to a a community like ours, which was founded in 1906, there is no room to grow. There's no cornfield that we can go build something else in. Uh, we're at the point now and have been for a long time of, of being built out. Uh, we did accomplish a merger with the borough of Wimson Hills in the early 2000s to help expand the tax base, um, which has proven very successful. But our focus is on the residential and then knowing that the commercial helps pay for those things keeps affordable taxes and so on in place. But being 115 or so years old, we recognize that it's time to start upgrading things. So we went to a lot of effort to upgrade infrastructure, streets and public water and sewer and so on. Uh, we did a lot to update our zoning. The zoning had been written years before and now we're in a different era. So we have to keep our eyes open to those things. And uh, that set us up to then begin the effort of the attracting some commercial use to reinvent some of our older areas, particularly over at the, the old Wymas and Industries. Uh, those became the outlets, the outlets changed and it was time to reinvent again. And we started that with the Wymas and Square project, a company from Philly called Brickstone was another absolutely top flight uh, organization. They were followed by Equus and it's, uh, I think we've proven our worth to those folks. Now, what I'm most concerned about is the future though. You know, where are we go from here? You can never, it never ends. You've got to keep working at it. You've got to keep updating yourselves. And we now have the medical school. Uh, that medical school opened uh, a month or so ago in conjunction between uh, Tower Health and Drexel University. They have a uh, campus in Philadelphia and Queens Lane, as well as the one here. There's going to be a lot of interaction back and forth between them. Their first class, which is now enrolled and in, in studies, is a total of about 300 students. About 40 of them are here, the other 60 or so down in Philly. But there is a lot of interaction, as I said. And uh, that came from a pool of applicants of over 17,000, which is hard to imagine. Um, 
But nevertheless, I think that there is a heck of a future for that. We in Berks County have for ages talked about having been very proud of five colleges. That's down Penn State, Berks, Alvernia, Albright, Rock. Great. Now there's six. And we have to look at it as six. It's that big of a deal. This is a major, major thing to have that medical school here. Um, we got to support it. So we have a proposal in front of us to consider a significantly sized apartment building that would help house staff and, and students and so on. Uh, hopefully that turns out. Uh, we have to enhance those existing residential areas in order to support this. Um, we have to continually look at refurbishing and refreshing our retail districts. We were always very fortunate to have the outlets, and the mall, and on all the peripheral things. Things have changed. I may be the first to tell you that there's a new thing out there called Amazon, and it's it's changed things forever. And we've got to find ways to stay ahead of that. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that. One of the areas of principle we've spoken for a couple of years with Alan Piper in County Planning about we need another lane on State Hill Road. It's terribly congested. But then we got to really take a hard look at those areas. Um, Michelle Bear, our economic development coordinator, has worried about this a lot already, and we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about it in the coming years about really what happens here. I mean, are companies going to need all the office space? Are they going to, you know, the changes in retail uh, are astonishing and how all that area is best utilized in the coming years is without letting it go into a negative sort of uh, realm is, is something that we're going to really worry a great deal about. Um, we want to work with the school district. Actually, we have two school districts. The north side of the borough is serviced by the Wilson School District, as well as obviously the Wyomissing District. So we have good relationships with both of those. We have regular meetings with them. We want to continue to do that sort of thing. We also have worked very well with the county. So I, I want to thank you for all your, your help in making things happen there at the, the, the knitting mills and so on. Um, I think we have some really exciting things that we can consider, which I'll touch on in one minute. Um, but in the meantime, um, we have to look at, at what we have. Uh, Tower has the Reading Hospital nearby. Their executive offices are right there at the Knitting Mills, actually on the West Reading side, but right there. The medical school now. Uh, UGI Energy has moved in there with a major office facility. Um, in front of the medical school is the Telflex building. Telflex is a manufacturer of specialty medical devices, catheters and that sort of thing. Their research and development facility is there, here. And I've spoken to them about what the opportunities are to have interaction between the medical school and Telflex, as the Telflex people can see the stuff getting used and the medical students can see it being developed and perhaps participate to some degree in that. So there's exciting opportunities there. Um, I believe, therefore, in doing this stuff cooperatively, not just focusing on ourselves in Wyoming, but working, as I've said already, with the county, but also with our friends in West Reading, as John alluded to, we have a good relationship with the West Reading Borough Council and their people, the wonderful job they've done on Penn Avenue. Uh, Spring Township to our west um, has long been a leader in having a lot of retail spaces, and they're going to have some challenges that we need to help. We want to work with them together on. But in looking at these things, I think to enhance the quality of life in Berks County, one of the keys is going to be reestablishing that long sought passenger train to Philadelphia. Uh, there are just innumerable connections between uh, Tower, uh, as recently announced in an affiliation with Penn Medical. Um, we have the obvious thing with Drexel. Well, when you look at the route of the train, one of the stops in Philadelphia is 30th Street Station. 33th Station will give us access to go north to New York and south to Washington, D.C. and everything in between. But the medical school is at Drexel, and Drexel is literally across the street from 30th Street Station. Adjacent to Drexel is the University of Pennsylvania, and their incredible medical campus, one of the finest in the entire world, no exaggeration. So I think that the opportunities 
to take advantage of a train going to be able to make those connections is just blatantly obvious, but something that will go tremendously well in helping us utilize and making best advantage of this. Therefore, a key to this train is that it must come over to the borough of Wyoming. There has been some talk. I've been involved in promoting that service for years with the Chamber of Commerce, and there is talk about it staying in downtown Reading at Franklin Street. And there, believe me, nobody wants downtown Reading to, to thrive more than we do. But to best utilize this, to take full advantage, multiply the effects of it, it would promote local travel. You could literally take the train from Wyoming missing into downtown Reading to go to a hockey game, whatever the heck it might be. We got that Tower Pen thing and the medical school thing. Telflex, as I've been mentioned a couple of times, has a facility in King of Prussia, which is also on the line. So the opportunities are boundless. I'm not keen, particularly as I get older, about phase twos. Oh yeah, we'll get to that later. I don't know about that. I'm running out of patience for that stuff. I think we need to do it from day one, have that connection. A uh, story I've often told, I know some of you have heard is, if my doctor ever gives me six months to live, I wanna make sure I'm in Berks County because everything seems to happen six months later. You know, I mean, it's just, everything goes on for years and years and years and years, and we don't want that to happen. We gotta have it happen now. We're gonna do it right and take full advantage of that service. So I encourage the commissioners to not only continue, as I know you have and done wonderful things with it already, to get that service in place, but to make sure it comes to Wyoming as well as the Red. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Fred. Um, I'll make some comments at the end, but I will tell you on as it comes to the train, the best advice I can give to why I'm missing is continue to advocate for your community, continue to advocate uh, not just within the local. <laughs> has done an amazing job advocating uh, for itself and for the people it represents and as I noted earlier, uh, the region has benefited as a result of much of the development that we've seen uh, here in the wine missing area. Any other comments from my colleagues before we move into the meeting? Oh, so to, <clears throat> sorry. Thank the mayor and uh, John for their comments. Uh, wine missing definitely is an area that continues to grow. And it's in part because of the willingness of council and the mayor to be able to do what needs to get done to open the possibilities to businesses coming in. So that's something when businesses see that a municipality is doing that, that they're open, that they're willing to work with them, that continues to attract other businesses to come to the area as well. So thank you for being forward looking for reusing spaces that if not may sit vacant for years and years to come become an eyesore boost the tax revenue. That's another great thing that has been happening here as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Rivera. At this time, we're going to have a weekly COVID-19 report. Uh, it's being presented by Brian Gottschall. Brian Gottschall is our director of the Berks County Department of Emergency Services. And before he jumps into his presentation, uh, I want to recognize that this evening, uh, he received the Community Partner Award from the Burke County Intermediate Unit. Uh, Commissioner Rivera and I were over there. All three commissioners uh, strongly supported that. I presented a certificate on behalf of the commissioners. Ron, I let you know, you as well. Uh, let me tell you, throughout this COVID-19 pandemic, and we're not through it, our masks uh, clearly indicate, uh, Brian, there's no more important person on the Berks County uh, COVID leadership team than Brian Gottschall. Brian has been a stalwart. He, his knowledge, even though he often puts himself down, 
His knowledge is incredible. And if he doesn't have the answer, he knows where to get it. And he has an incredible team uh, supporting him. So with that, Brian, don't let us down. Take it away with the COVID-19 uh, report. Thank you, Commissioner. You've uh, set the bar high for this week, so I hope that uh, everything sounds okay. I've got a little bit of an echo, but I'm going to keep going because I'm assuming you can hear it okay. Uh, I think you're okay. I am that you're okay. All righty, great. Uh, so we're going to start out with our normal cases and testing slide where we show the uh, total number of cases in the blue line and the total number of tests registered on a seven day for testing and 14 day smooth curve. Um, we continue to see an upward trend, although much slower. If you look carefully at the right hand side of the graph, it actually looks as though there's a slight downward bump. But the reality is when you look at the data, that's more of a leveling off than any type of a downward bump. Uh, so we are still seeing uh, case numbers significantly beyond where we were over the summer months, not approaching where we were in the initial uh, COVID spike or in the follow on spring of uh, 2021 surge, but still very concerning. Um, our testing positivity continues to be very high in excess of 30% smoothed over seven days. And I will point out that the other thing that this high positivity comes with is a large testing volume. Uh, for many months, we were not meeting the minimum number of tests that really should be taken within the community to ensure that the statistical evaluation is correct. For the last number of weeks, we are well exceeding that minimum number, which obviously indicates a significant number of people in the community who either have COVID-like symptoms or who believe that they've had a contact and therefore producing for testing. Our hospitals, while still doing uh, great uh, and still working very strong, are also very busy. Uh, we see the numbers continuing to go up. Uh, this last week bump was one of the larger bumps that we've seen in any week over week as far as the total number of known or suspected cases in-house. Uh, fortunately, our ICU cases and cases on vents continue to be much higher than we want them to be, which is a zero, but uh, not outrageous or in any risk of overwhelming the hospital's capabilities. Uh, some bad news, we do see our COVID deaths uh, beginning to trend up. We had a very long period of a fairly flat line there, and now we're starting to see our weekly uh, smoothed COVID deaths uh, get close to double digits again, which is obviously not where we want to get. That causes us to bring back into play this slide that we had retired for some time, which is our demonstration of deaths as a lagging indicator of cases. And in the right-hand part of the slide, just to remind the folks who are regular viewers, or to help the folks that are not regular viewers, this is a dual axis slide. So on the left-hand side is the, uh, is the legend of the slide, the measure of the slide for the blue line, which shows cases going up to 5,000 at the top of the chart. On the right-hand side of the slide is a different scale going up to a maximum of 180, which is for the black line, which shows our COVID deaths. So in no way are we representing here back in November of 2021 that our deaths were approaching our cases. There's merely a relationship between peak deaths and peak cases. And what we see is that as cases rise and fall, so do deaths rise and fall. But they rise and fall later on the slide as a lagging indicator. Said very simply, the more people get sick, the more people get very sick, the more people that die. And we see that uh, in this more recent surge being referred to as the Delta surge, we are seeing our deaths begin to go up at the same slope as our cases went up a number of weeks ago. And we see that trend following backwards throughout the uh, graph as, as we've gone through the COVID crisis, that as cases have risen weeks later, so do deaths. And of course, that's the ultimate outcome that we're all most in fear of, that we see individuals losing their life to this disease when perhaps they could avoid that outcome uh, through proper early identification and quarantining of positive cases. And of course, vaccination, which has been demonstrated to not necessarily prevent contraction of the disease at this juncture with the current variant, but to help to avoid serious illness, hospitalization, and ultimately death among many people. 
Looking at our vaccinations in the county, we continue to be ninth in the state. Uh, makes sense as we're ninth in the state by population. And uh, we have gone up one position in fully vaccinated per capita this week with no change in our at least first dose numbers this week. Taking a look at our 70% goal, Pennsylvania rests at about 67.5% fully vaccinated. Berks County lags at about 63% fully vaccinated. When we look at how close we are to hitting that goal, considering folks that may have started their vaccination series, uh, the raw data would say that we're in great shape, that if the folks who have started the series complete the series, we would be at about 75% of our population over the age of 18 having been vaccinated. As we pointed out in the last number of weeks, there is a large number of people uh, who appear to have stagnated at the first dose, where they have gone for the first dose and are so significantly past when they should have gone for their second dose that we anticipate that they're likely not going to go for that second dose. And when we use those values to back those folks out of this raw number that would get us to 75, the reality is that even if the folks who have all started only complete their series, it gets us to just under our 70% goal at about 66.5%. Um, on the good news front, again, as we look at our growth since the end of May, these are changes since the end of May. And in the left-hand side of the slide, we see by percentage how Pennsylvania has grown in their vaccinations and how Berks County has grown in, in our vaccinations. And the good news is that in all age groups, apart from the age group of 12 to 18, we lead the state in growth by percentage. So. Uh, maybe we're late starters here in Berks County. Maybe we're uh, still getting our feet under us. But the good news is we are growing at a rate faster than the state average when looked at from May 26 to today. Uh, finally, just a reminder that approximately three weeks ago, there was a change in the strategy for immunocompromised individuals, uh, folks who meet that categorization based on disease state or certain medications that they may be taking are able to uh, go and receive a third dose of the messenger RNA vaccines for a total three dose series. And just to emphasize, this is different from the discussed but not yet recommended boosters for the general population. So folks that uh, are in that immunocompromised group, we would encourage them if they are at least four weeks out from their second dose of an mRNA vaccine to uh, pursue through their medical professional or through a pharmacy a third dose of the mRNA vaccine, which now makes a full series for those individuals. And lastly, we always want to remind people to go to doyourpartburks.com uh, where our public outreach folks are doing yeoman work trying to keep tabs on where the best places are to go and find vaccine. The reality is it's omnipresent in our community. Uh, you, you can't not find it these days. Uh, and we would encourage folks to look at doyourpartburks.com, talk to their local pharmacist or talk to their healthcare providers about the concept of vaccination and where to go and do it. That's my report for the week, Commissioner. Unless you guys have any questions or the public has any questions, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? And I don't see any comments on the uh, line here. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, Brian. And we'll turn now to Commissioner Kevin Barnhart for the Coe County Wellness Update. Thank you, Commissioner Leinbach and Brian Gotch. Welcome everyone to our first uh, on the road meeting here at the Wyoming Library. I appreciate the attendance and your participation. Uh, I generally give an, a bi-weekly report on the Coe County Wellness, which includes contact tracing. We hired uh, Coe County Wellness last June to do contact tracing for the community. I've done a tremendous job thus far. Uh, unfortunately, the contact, new contact, date of September 1 and September 5th is 456. The prior two week period was 380. We're still hovering around about 70% compliance when people actually are, are notified by Co County Wellness and their call folks uh, to actually be part of a contact tracing. They've also done a tremendous job standing up our call center when we instituted our vaccine center in the Muhlenberg uh, area for several months. Uh, they continue to support us in every way possible. And just by comparison, we know that many other counties throughout the county, uh, throughout the state and the nation spent millions of dollars on contact tracing 
because of the support we have from Co-County Wellness, uh, they only have charged thus far $218,000. In addition to that, their volunteer support would have cost $331,000. So again, it's a real uh, tremendous benefit that we have this group in our uh, community and are doing a tremendous job for us. And again, unfortunately, the numbers continue to go in the wrong direction. That's since the beginning of the pandemic, right, Commissioner? With, with Co-County Wellness? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's a awesome number. Yes. So they're doing a, a great job for us. And I just wanted to commend you here in public again, as, as we try to do, uh, because they are really dollar for dollar quite the value, and their success rate is much higher than most of the other numbers we hear as well. So thank you. I'm glad to hear that uh, Carolyn Basic, who runs Cook County Wellness, she understands their tax dollars. They make them from the federal government, uh, but uh, they're still tax dollars and we need to spend them very, very carefully. And uh, they've done that. Thank you, Commissioner Barnhart. Uh, moving in, uh, moving forward with the agenda, are there any additions or corrections for the September 9th Commissioner meeting minutes? Hearing none, the minutes will stand approved as presented. Uh, Mary, is there any public comment on specific agenda items? There is not. Okay, moving into the agenda. Item one authorized under that department. Adopt a resolution authorizing 2021 budget transfers in the amount of $144,763 and 2021 appropriations in the negative amount of $318,000 per listing dated September the 13th of 2021. We have two items listed under human resources. Item one, authorizing the transfer of Valerie Berger from victim witness coordinator in the district attorney's office to judicial coordinator in court administration. And then item two, authorize a $250 uniform clothing allowance for lieutenants and sergeants at the jail system per attached list. Purchasing, uh, we have one item, a document resolution authorizing the award and the director of contracts and procurements to execute as a result of an invitation to bid a contract for the Schubert Bridge. Uh, this is adjustment and repair, uh, abutment and repair project. It goes to Desco Design out of Fleetwood, Pennsylvania, and the total bid amount is a not to exceed of $30,770. There are several items listed under the commissioners. Item A, adopt a resolution authorizing execution of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture Program Management Agreement for the Emergency Food Assistance Program and Plan of Operation Agreement with Helping Harvest for participating in the Emergency Food Assistance Program for a five year period ending September the 30th of 2026. Item B, adopt a resolution authorizing execution of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Game Commission, and the County of Berks through the Department of Emergency Services for access to radio owned and operated by the commission for the express purpose of cooperation and coordination between federal and local public safety agencies. Item C, adopt a resolution authorizing execution of an amendment to the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, requesting a modification to a subgrant to extend the timeline to September 30th of 2022 due to COVID-19 related delays. Item D, adopt a resolution authorizing Robert Patrizio, Chief Financial Officer to execute the 2021-2022 application for the volunteer accident renewal policy with the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania. Item E, adopt a resolution ratifying, confirming and approving execution of a letter of support to Angela Watson, Acting Director of the Bureau of Rail Freight, Ports and Waterways, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, on behalf of the Redevelopment Authority of the County of Berks, for a grant application to the Rail Transportation Assistance Program for the multi-phase critical capacity improvements needed on the Eastern Berks Gateway Railroad, that is the freight side of the Colebrookdale Railroad, uh, 
and if anyone has questions on that, we can explain why it's called the Eastern Berks Gateway Railroad uh, later on. Item F, adopt a resolution authorizing execution of a letter of support to the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania on behalf of the County of Berks and the Double Tree Hotel and Conference Center for a proposal to host the August 2026 CCAP Annual Conference. Item two, a motion to authorize execution of contract agreements and, and amendments as set forth in the attached listing dated September the 14th of 2021. There are a total of 15 contracts, five with children youth services, three with facilities, two with the library, three with mental health and developmental disabilities, and two with the solicitor's office. And then item three, a motion to authorize execution of the payments and electronic transfers as forth on the controller's office voucher listing dated September the 16th of 2021. Motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Is carried. With that, we will turn to our county treasurer, Dennis Adams, with the county treasurer's report. Dennis? Good evening. Oh, I'll Good talk evening. To change the uh, tune up a little bit. Uh, our opening fund today was $225,930,475.46. We had a balance to clear of $6,182,071.75 with a closing balance of $219,478,433.71. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll now go to our county controller, Sandy Graffius, for the controller's report. Sandy. Okay, thank you, everybody. I hope you can hear me with my mask. I'm, I'm such a quiet speaker. Okay. As of you in the room know, I'm a quiet speaker, right? Raise your index finger if you agree. No fingers. Okay. All right. Our total counts payable eight million six hundred ninety thousand three hundred fifty one dollars and thirty seven cents. We had a payroll of four million three hundred thirty seven thousand seven hundred fifty dollars and forty eight cents for a grand total this week of thirteen million twenty eight thousand one hundred one dollars and eighty five cents. Thank you very much, Sandy, and that concludes uh, well, not quite. I'm Peter, Chief Administrative Officer. I'm going to Ron uh, with your report. Uh, thank you, Chairman Leinbach. Uh, in my mind, it's difficult to comprehend that next Wednesday, September 27th, officially marks the end of summer with the beginning of the autumn season. But with that, our Parks and Recreation Department is still providing some uh, local programming uh, on a limited basis. The uh, last event in the month of September being a week from this Saturday, on Saturday, September the 25th at 1 p.m. Uh, is a program entitled Walk with a Doctor. Uh, this is gonna take place at 200 Swiftwater Lane in Leesport. It's a walkers of all ages joining local pediatrician, Dr. Robert Portis, on a two mile round trip hike on the Union Canal Connector Trail, we started at the Ace Blue Marsh Lake Stillwater Lane parking area. The hike does have a slight hill and will highlight natural features and historic points of interest to be shared by the park staff. The path is suitable for strollers and well behaved in these paths, and the event will be held rain or shine. There are no restroom facilities available along the hike trail. But you're urged to bring water bottles and good work with walking shoes. Then in October, Friday the 8th, there's going to be a unique uh, opportunity from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. to join uh, members of the park volunteer staff on guided lantern tours of the Hoover Wagon Works. This is located, of course, at the Berks County Heritage Center. And uh, 
You're going to have a unique opportunity to do tour this one of the kind of historic landmark. The tour will start every half hour. Pre registration is required for this event with a cost of $5 per person. And to register, you contact Daniel Rowe, the county works. <clears throat> that information can be located on the Parks and Recreation Department Facebook page. On Saturday, October the 23rd, from 1 to 4 p.m., again at Berks County Heritage Center, we're celebrating Harvest Fun Day. This will uh, allow you to join Berks County Parks and Recreation Department and the Oakham Institute Fun Hill the afternoon at the Heritage Center. The middle school, high school ensemble will perform the legends of Berks County, and there'll be games, wagon rides, uh, juggling workshops, pumpkin painting, apple prints, and sing-alongs. And then last, in Sunday, October 24th at 2 p.m., there's another interesting program at the Berks County Heritage Center when local historian and Revolutionary War expert Lynn Otto will present a program on the Pennsylvania Long Rifle or the Kentucky Long Rifle. And Mr. Otto will teach about the history of the Pennsylvania Long Rifle and the ongoing naming debut uh, debate of Pennsylvania versus Kentucky. He'll also focus on gun making in colonial America. The mother notes, Antietam Lake Park, the Seidel Road Trailhead, and Antietam Lake Park remains closed due to storm damage from Hurricane Ida. Uh, there are repairs being proposed for that, but uh, for the time being, it remains closed. And the Gruber Wagon Works and Easter Canal Center continue to offer tours available on Fridays and Saturdays from 10 to 4 every hour on the hour with the last tour beginning at 3 p.m. And on Sundays, from to 4 every hour on the hour with the last tour at 3 p.m. Visitors may uh, secure tickets for these tours in the lower level of the barn at the Heritage Center. Take part in what the Parks Department has to offer. You'll have some great weekends. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, and with that, we'll now move to Commissioner's reports and we'll begin with my colleague, Commissioner Michael Rivera. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Leinbach. Uh, before I get started with my report, I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really know what to expect tonight, if we would have a full house, if we would have maybe uh, just one or two people here. So it's great to see a full house and great to see how many people are interested in county government. So thank you very much for being here tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also thank you to the White Missing Library for hosting us here today as well. Uh, the past week, the uh, Reading Public Museum, together with the Burke County Library System, cut the ribbon for a story walk at the museum. And basically what it is, it's a children's book and it takes you on a one mile walk around the grounds of the Reading Public Museum and you stop at different stations reading this children's book. So it's a great opportunity to get out with your kids or by yourself and be able to walk the park and uh, read the book, stopping at these different stations, learning about nature. It's right along the river there, so it's a beautiful walk. So if you do have the opportunity, if you have your kids, grandkids, please make sure you stop there and uh, do the, the story walk. It'll take about 20 minutes if you do the full walk. So that's a great opportunity uh, there. I also want to take a minute to congratulate Brian Gacho, uh on his accomplishment. Brian has been an integral part of our team, especially in this last 18 months, 19 months during COVID. Uh, I've only been with the county for a little under two years, two years now. And it always amazes me the work that Brian does and the knowledge that he brings to the job. And if he doesn't know something, he'll go out will make do his research and in, inform us and, and bring valuable information to us. So Brian, congratulations on your award today. A few events that are going on uh, within the community. Uh, we have the Fall 21 Road Ramble from the Burks History Center. And what that does, it takes you to different places throughout the county. It's a self-guided driving tour. You get a CD, which you put in your car, 
and it talked about different locations within the county uh, where you go to visit. Tickets are on sale. This is on October 9th. You can really do it any day you want, but they do it on October 9th, inviting people to go out and uh, do the road ramble, and then they have a location where they finish and they have water and refreshments and so forth. It's $35 per car for Earth's History Center members or $45 per car for non-members. So for more information, visit the burkeshistory.org website. Again, that's burkeshistory.org. It's a great opportunity to learn more about Berks County and the rich history that it has. Also, Hispanic Heritage Month started yesterday and it runs through October the 15th. Uh, to celebrate that, there are various events going on, but two that I want to highlight today is there will be the Pennsylvania Latino Convention held at the Doubletree from the 28th to the 30th of this month, as well as the second annual Puerto Rican Parade and Greater Reading South Festival on Sunday, September 26th at City Park. The parade starts at 2nd and Penn Street at 11 a.m. and it ends at City Park with the rest of the day as the Salsa Festival. When I say salsa, it's not the salsa that you eat with chips and dips, but the I'm, dance. Not, I'm not going. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I if, I'm going. he is, yes. So if you do have an opportunity, please stop by uh, and visit. This weekend, there are a few events going on. Uh, one is the 74th Oldie Valley Community Fair, and this is uh, today, tomorrow, and Saturday. Uh, the fair is known for its famous French fries, hamburgers, and much more. So come out and visit. It's rain or shine. For more information, oldyfair.org. Again, oldyfair.org. Also this weekend, uh, tomorrow and Saturday, is the 14th annual Boyertown October Fest. For more information on that, you can go to buildingabetterboyertown.org. But and this is a German and fall themed event for the family. So make sure uh, you go and visit that. And that's all I have. But again, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Commissioner Leinbach, back to you. Thank you, Rivera. Mary and I heard today from Katie Hildebrand in our ag department. <laughs> At the only fair was over 1,200. Try that again. I, I didn't have my mic flipped over. Is that better? Thank you. Uh, what I was commenting on the only fair, uh, Mary and I talked to uh, our director of our ag department, Tammy Hildebrand, today, and she said the winning pumpkin at the only fair is over 1,200 pounds. I can't imagine much of anything that you grow that grows over 1,200 pounds. So that would be worth it to see just there. Uh, with that, turn to Commissioner Kevin Barnhart uh, for your report. You're doing better than I am. At least you remember to turn it over. The message that said, hold your phone close to your face and speak slower. So I'm going to try. So good evening once again. Thank you, Commissioner Leinbach. Just by a point of information, I'd like to let our viewers as well as the public here Understand that the BSERT team, the Berks County Emergency Response Team, which is heavily supported by the county and the borough of Wyomissing, is instituting an emergency response team uh, with crisis negotiation training to team negotiation personnel in order to prepare them to achieve objectives. These trained personnel are capable of being crisis negotiation resource to local police departments, even when BSERT is not deployed at the scene of a critical incident. When a department is in need of an officer with advanced negotiation skills for an incident that does not warrant a BSERT call out, these trained personnel will be made available to assist other law enforcement agencies. Berks County Department of Emergency Services will be provided with a list of and contact information for the trained personnel that may be accessed in the event of a critical incident. This again is a mutual cooperation. Agencies requesting assistance as mutual aid will accept total liability for the scene, scene management, and the outcome of the incident unless additional tactical resource are requested or on the scene. Command and control of the resource will fall under the officer in charge of the home police department. Any negotiator who is assisting with an incident shall be permitted to withdraw from a mutual aid agreement if the officer communicates to the officer in charge that he or she cannot accomplish the assigned mission. When required, a BSERT tactical response may be requested through the normal channels 
and will include all assets of the BSER team, including a mental health consultant. Again, I wanted to emphasize that this is a mutual cooperation through numerous uh, police agencies throughout this uh, wonderful county, and we're doing everything we can on that end to help people that really are not uh, a threat as much, but they do have some some issues that meet, need to be held and dealt with by professionals uh, in that realm. Uh, as part of a meeting today uh, that Stan Papadimitri, our executive director of SOS Burks, the Opioids Coalition, I held uh, with law enforcement personnel from the city, the chief, uh, the lieutenant of vice, as well as district attorney and his uh, chief, and discussing the uh, the overdose situation that occurred here last week and the nearly 101 overdoses and kind of tabletop exercise, uh, what we can do uh, in the future moving forward. We learned this, unfortunately, as the district attorney pointed out, it's really been a poison, but it was a, a huge amount. Uh, but with the cooperative efforts of city police and the county detectives, they were able to successfully uh, drop this in within three days and make several arrests. But uh, we had some takeaways. Uh, we need to have a better communication with the hospital and the district attorney is, is taking that under his uh, wing. And we have some protocol modifications at both the dispatch centers at the county, as well as the city dispatch. Brian Gottschall, 24 hour Gottschall was also included in this meeting today. So it was really well received and uh, Unfortunately, these types of things do occur, but the magnitude was overwhelming. And one of the things you learn as you're in a meeting like this, uh, I learn a lot every day, but how the calls come into uh, our not in call center, you know, you would think that everyone's going to call in and say it's an overdose. A lot of them come in as unconscious person, uh, possible heart attack. I just see somebody laying in the street. So they're not actually called in as, as overdoses until obviously EMS is dispatched. And with this large number, this 101 overdoses, there was a significant number that were just dropped off by vehicles. So they were not all EMS dispatches, but they were also dropped off uh, by personal vehicles. But uh, definitely don't want to ever see this happen again. But if some of this poison does creep into our community, uh, it seems to me, and I'm very confident that uh, the folks that were assembled today are going to make sure that we can nip this in the bud at darn sight earlier uh, in the future. Last but not least, I don't want to be redundant, but again, this is our first on the road meeting. I do want to compliment uh, the borough why I'm missing, uh, especially the library. And Sheehan was the first one to contact their office and say, let's lose the library. So I want to commend everyone. Our IT staff has done overtime uh, setting this up with the new equipment, keeping their fingers crossed, everything works out. Uh, Carmen Tour as our new chief clerk has done a tremendous job of scheduling this and putting everything together. But this really, who I really have to thank for the idea, uh, more importantly, was Karen Shuey. Uh, she had told me that the Lancaster County Commissioners uh, do this on a frequent basis. So I reached out to my colleague, Craig Lehman in Lancaster County. I went down to uh, one of their townships back in the early summer. Uh, it seems like I ended up in Delaware. It was so far down uh, in Southern Lancaster County, but I learned a lot and I wanted to bring that back uh, to my colleagues, they were overly supportive of this. And again, I want to thank Why Missing and Muhlenberg Township who have agreed to host us through the balance of this year. And we already have these four communities for 2022. And the goal is to keep them in kind of in different jurisdictions. So we have Hamburg, Cumber Township, Birdsboro, and Rockland who have uh, stepped forward. So with the support of the IT department, if they have the capability, uh, we will meet either in their township building or their borough building or their fire company or their library. Uh, we want to spread that kind of uh, opportunity out there for people who otherwise can't come downtown uh, on a Thursday morning at 10 a.m. So with that, I'll turn the uh, meeting back over to Ali Commissioner Leinbach. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barnhart. Uh, just a couple of items that I want to touch on. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, we had our Berks County America 250 PA Berks Committee meeting. And what that is, uh, in 2026, the United States will be celebrating the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence as a result of federal legislation forming the America 
250 uh, organization celebration. The Commonwealth followed up with America 250 PA. And I'm proud to say Berks County was the first county or any governmental entity in Pennsylvania to adopt a resolution forming its own committee. The city of Reading was the first city in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to uh, uh, formally adopt such a resolution. And Amity Township was the first municipality. They actually adopted it like a week after we did. They said, hey, can we see what you adopted? Great, we're adopting it too. So Berks County had a real lead. Uh, in the future, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I want to tell you about two things and hopefully kind of get this information out to the public. There are two programs uh, that are actively uh, being done in Pennsylvania. One is referred to as Bell across Pennsylvania. These are fiberglass, light size uh, copies or replicas of the Liberty Bell. There'll be both exterior and interior bell. Uh, it, we have to raise $10,000 for either type of bell, an interior or exterior, and we have to identify a local artist who will decorate the bell. These are not unlike uh, frogs in West Reading, the border town bear, et cetera. I think it's a great idea. The key on the interior bell, most likely, if we do one, uh, it'll be in the Berks County Services Center or Courthouse. Uh, if we would do two, likely in the city of Reading. Exterior, a lot more opportunities. There can be no more than two actual sponsors on any bill. Uh, so two companies or individuals or organizations to put $5,000 in, uh, they'll allow that. They don't want three, four, five organizations. And we have to have 10 plus orders, not us as a county, but statewide in order to get uh, the um, contractor that's gonna do the project to do the first order. We don't know when that'll happen, but if you uh, as an individual, an organization, a company are interested in that, please contact my office, contact uh, Ron Seaman, our Chief Administrative Officer, we will get you the information. The second program is the Liberty Tree Project. And as much as I love history, I was not aware that after 1776, the British burned the original Liberty Tree. And for most of us, we would think well, that's the end of that. But very smart people were able to save root structure and clone that, I believe it's an American pop uh, is the type of tree. And those descendants of that Liberty tree are available today. Uh, this program is being sponsored uh, by the Masonic Lodge in Pennsylvania. And the first tree will be planted uh, in Harrisburg, and I forget the name of the lodge, but it's a main Masonic lodge. I'm looking at uh, my colleague because you're 30 degree, right? 30, 30. 30, 30 degree. I was, I was off three digits. Uh, maybe, but they're sponsoring it. We have been told we, Berks County, will be the next on the list. They don't want to plant a sapling until it's four to six feet tall. We're hoping that might be next year. Uh, they're not looking for a sponsor for that. Uh, that already is sponsored. So uh, keep your eyes open. I have to talk to my colleagues, but I'll talk to them now uh, because I couldn't talk to them one-on-one -on -one anyhow about it. Uh, my idea is that this is something that may fit well at the Heritage Center uh, for the county because that is great. We have the Gruber Wagon Works. We have uh, the Canal Museum uh, and, and the like. It, it's all about uh, Berks County heritage. The last thing I want to touch on is I want to go back to our hosts here. Uh, Why Missing is a great place. We already talked about the Equus Project and how consequential. And I, I'm not trying to be melodramatic. That is an incredible project, and it has changed the economy locally. I believe that in large part because of that, 
in the next five years, you're going to see healthcare jobs outstrip manufacturing jobs in Berks County. And that is saying something. Uh, the latest I looked, and I'm approximate on this, I believe the manufacturing jobs are 29,000 to 30,000. Healthcare jobs are around 28,000. Uh, this is a big deal. Along with that, several months ago, like you, I was very, very concerned about the future of Tower Health. Uh, and it wasn't just me. I was contacted by Commissioner Marion Moskowitz in Chester County, a good friend who chairs their board of commissioners, and Commissioner Ken Lawrence in Montgomery County. Both of those counties are also served by Tower Health. And we asked for a meeting with Tower Health, which they granted, and this is probably more like six, seven months ago. And they shared what they were able to share with us, the challenges, a lot of what we already knew about being fully leveraged. But I will tell you, we are a lucky community in having somebody like Dr. Sue Parati to step in the way she did uh, to take the leadership with Tower Health. Because what she was able to do is not what we, at least many of us expected. Many of us thought Tower Health was headed towards an outright sale, and if they were sold, that we would likely lose the headquarters status of a major regional health care provider. Instead, what uh, Sue Parati was able to do was to pull together a critical alliance with Penn Medicine. That alliance, I believe, is going to make Tower Health ultimately even stronger. You look at that, and I think Fred referred to this, you look at that in line with the Drexel uh, University College of Medicine uh, relationship and Tower Health, this is a very good story for Berks. This anchor company, uh, they are the number two uh, provider of jobs in Berks County, roughly 7,800 jobs just behind East Penn Manufacturing at roughly 7,900 jobs. That's great news. And our, I, I, I know Sue's, Sue's look, we are lucky to have somebody like that here in Berks County. And I think sometimes we miss the significance of things like this until we're lost. And that very well could happen. I'm not saying everything is perfect, but at the ribbon cutting, I talked to Dan Aaron, I talked to Sue. They told me, wait three days. I think I'm going to be very happy. And I was, but they also shared with me some of the very good uh, turnaround information on the financials. So uh, that is great for a community. The last thing I want to say about this community, and it was also alluded to, while you need to continue to be proud of why you're missing Burrow and what you've accomplished, what you've done, one of your strengths is that you work together with your partners, not just with the County of Berks, but West Reading. And I always am amazed. We think about West Reading, why missing Burrow. But there's no line to trip over when you're coming down Penn Avenue that tells you, oh, I just fell into why I'm missing Burrow or I just fell into Penn uh, to West Reading. These two communities have worked together so well in a lot of different events. One that I participated in until the pandemic is the Armed Forces Day Parade uh, that they have handled the oldest in the country. There's no Armed Forces Parade that has gone on as long as the Berks County Armed Forces Day Parade. In fact, until the pandemic, it had never missed a year. Uh, of uh, operation. But that's a great example. The two communities come together and they make one parade a huge success. And if I have anything to leave you with, that's the message. We succeed when we work together. We fail when we or I become so self-centered that everything has to be about me or everything has to be about a particular community. 
when we look and say, what can we do together? What can we accomplish together? There's no limit to what we can do when we work together. At this time, I want to recognize uh, any role officer would like to make a comment. I actually think I have one written down here. Did you want to make a comment? Mary, your name's listed down here. No, okay. Sandy Graphics, you can get round two. Here, he'll hand you a microphone. Thank you, Michael. I want to tell you, we're going to be using debit cards again for the elected officials, I mean, for the election workers. So please, 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 if you have money left in your card, would you please use it? Because now you're going to start getting a $3.95 charge each month on your card. It's going to start to disappear. So if you haven't opened your card and you don't know how, call our office, call the controller's office, we open it up. But we are going to use debit cards again for the election workers. And thanks to everybody. Karen Chewy has agreed to put an article in the paper showing how how really successful the program was. We had a 90% group of people that actually used their cards and cashed it. But use the rest of them. Thank you very much, Andy. Any other co-officers? And I'm looking uh, online as well. I think that's it. Uh, just to reiterate, I know we have a lot of uh, newer people here. Uh, the way we handle public comment now, they're both in person and virtual. Uh, when we go to public comment, we begin with those that are in person that show up a B or by seven o'clock. As soon as seven o'clock passes, I'm handed a sign. Uh, so we go to those individuals first. Then we go to any online uh, comments, which I last I looked at one online, uh, two online comments now. And then we will come back to anyone uh, that signed up after seven o'clock and we do have one person uh, for that. So we're gonna begin first person and you have the microphone for that person. Uh, the first one in person is Adrian Jadik from why missing just a reminder uh state your name where you're from and you have three minutes yes sir so i'm adrian jadik uh, i live in why missing thank you for coming here tonight and as usual your it runs quite a lot of operation here um so first of all uh, i would like to ask you to revisit the number of drop boxes for ballots even if we go to a total of three boxes is still an improvement. Additionally, I have to suggest an extension of the weekend hours, especially in the weekend prior to the election. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, go back a little bit to the Commissioner Linebach's message from last meeting, the message of unity delivered uh, at the meeting. I have to say I was extremely moved. It does, in fact, take courage from all sides to say and do what is right and to set an example for the residents. Just as you did back in November when you ran a flawless election operation, you're now setting an example by requiring masks in all county buildings. It takes courage to do that it, it, despite the avalanche of misinformation that goes around. And I'm going to pause for a second here and say, for those who don't know, I was an observer at the process the mail ballots, which took, I think, I remember about two weeks, close to two weeks. And uh, we all know we got each other and I'm not saying these words lightly. I'm not trying to strike them. So, um, <clears throat> since this is a joint meeting, I have to ask you for a favor. For weeks, I have tried to convince our council members to require masks at borough meetings. I've used all sorts of examples, including the county's mask policy. I see that tonight they do wear masks, but at our meetings, not one of them, neither the mayor is wearing a mask. So to me, the reasoning is simple. Take this example, smoking is prohibited due to the danger of secondhand smoke, and it does not revolve around the right of the smoker. It's not about the rights of a person, rather the ethics of allowing the exposure to the smoke to others. So what if we apply the same principle about COVID? 
the ethic principles are exactly the same. Beneficence, not beneficence, justice. In other words, duty to act for the common good, the duty to do no harm. These are the core ethical principles of our society. So back to the faith. I understand this is not within your responsibilities, but could you try to convince our elected officials that just like you, they have sworn to serve and protect our residents, but forcing the borough employees as well as the participating public to cram in a small room without fresh air intake goes against their pledge. Thank you. Julie, just on time. That's actually pretty impressive, uh, Adrian, on your time. You hit that time down <laughs> to the second. Thank you. Um, all the people on the list for, uh, that were here before seven, the, the other people were Mayor uh, Coke, our reporter deeds, and Fred, Le and I assume Fred Levering, you, know, you weren't planning to speak again. Well, Probably I'll shouldn't give you. I, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, Mayor, if you would please read the public comments uh, that are provided virtually. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Crystal Kowalski, why am I missing? Welcome to Missing. I would like to follow up on my comment from last week on a unified forensic audit of the Berks County Constable System. Thank you for addressing my comment at the end of last meeting. What I understand from your response is that the difficulty of retrieving and compiling data from many different agencies would make it very difficult, not impossible, to get meaningful results from an audit. As I recall, this difficulty in tracking data about the expenses and revenues involved in the constable system was the reason county leaders agreed an audit was needed. Given that the data could not be effectively retrieved, could we as a county in conjunction with the other agencies involved in maintaining and tracking information pertaining to the constable system move forward without an audit and commit ourselves to creating a new system where the money and activity could be tracked. Do any of your colleagues in the County Commissioners Association employ a system that they feel works well for their county? This constable issue has been raised publicly for a considerable number of years. Some of Dan Kelly's articles on the subject reference back to 2004, one Berks County Constable's yearly salary at $216,000 when the, the highest paid constable in Lehigh County was making $75,000. There are years of evidence to support changing the system. Please work with the other county leaders to establish a new system that has the ability to be mon monitored. Thank you, Crystal Kowalski. John James Burnville. Good job, commissioners, on the remote meetings. A great way to bring the representatives to the people. Thanks for this suggestion, Commissioner Barnhart. Regarding the rail proposal, do we have an idea stations are being considered and in which community? Thank you and keep up the good work. And that concludes the comments. Okay, with that, we'll move to the first comment. Good evening. Thank you. Jess Royer from Spring Township. As others have said, thank you guys for coming out to the community tonight. I think it's really great that we're here outside of a, a 10 a.m. midweek meeting so we can all be here. And definitely kudos to Why Missing Public Library. Libraries are pretty great. They, uh, they always play a role in connecting people to information and things that are happening in their world. Uh, I was not going to go the direction I'm going in a moment now, but we heard from a commenter a moment ago, and um, I want to tie it to comments that you made a moment ago, Commissioner Lambach, that there is um, a continued effort among county officials and, and, and medical professionals to educate the public on how best to operate within a pandemic, but we see there are elected officials and just community members who aren't always willing to 
um, look at the science and look at the recommendations as, as strongly as they should. Um, I think that, as you mentioned, Commissioner Weinbach, we do have a really good and strong medical community here in Berks County. And uh, we read earlier this week about the, the comments made at the operations meeting by Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael Baxter about the recommendations that the county can make in terms of helping to um, give suggestions to local issues and local operations on specifically how to operate within a pandemic. I think we could uh, really lean on some of our medical community. Um, we talked about uh, uh, looking at creating a health department. I know that the Berks County Community Foundation uh, has endorsed that idea. I know that the county has been looking at the idea. I think that's something that we need to continue working towards. Um, and, and those medical professionals, there are a lot of members of that community um, creating a plan to develop more drop boxes if we can do that and go that route. I think we should continue to work towards that, um, not just because the counties in the area have more drop boxes than we do, um, but we, we look at low voter turnout. And if it's not a presidential election, if it's not a congressional election, we bemoan that it's 20, 30, maybe 40% of the turnout. I think we wanna increase the access to dropping off the advanced ballots that people have gotten in the mail and make it as easy as possible to do that. And it's not a partisan issue. I, I know Commissioner Barnett said, mentioned that you were approached by a specific party, but it's really not about a party. It's, it's about access for everybody who has a ballot in their hands to return it in as easy a manner as possible. And, and I think that that would be a good way to sort of um, make it an option to, to return that ballot and to partake in the voting process that I think probably everybody here thinks is really important. Um, and we're out here at, at, a, at a civic event um, here on an evening. So um, I would encourage us to, to work towards um, ballot return access. Thank you. I'm in. <laughs> I've been here 14 years, uh, Sure, Barnard. We ever had two public people present back right in the second. Not that I can recall. No. Oh. Who knows? I'm, I'm looking around trying to figure out if there's a stopwatch behind me or something. So uh, that will open it up uh, for any uh, comments uh, from my colleagues, if you so desire. I, I'm going to comment on a couple of items. Uh, just to reiterate on the drop boxes, we need the legislature and uh, the governor to get together and address the rules around the election. Uh, I've made it very clear. It is frustrating to me that there are no rules around drop boxes, zero, nothing. There's nothing that allows them. There's nothing that disallows them. They need to be addressed. And I've said until the legislature steps up and does that, I'm, I, I'm not willing to move ahead and do anything. I'm also extremely frustrated that we are now within, help me out here, so Adrian, I actually, I think I got to know Adrian Blood through uh, the various connections uh, through the election and after the election. But pre-canvassing is critical. We had to hire numerous additional staff for election day because we had so many people having to work to do the pre-canvassing of mail-in and absentee ballots on election day. The tw in 2020 of November, that was a huge effort. Again, he was there along with a number of other observers at the Double Tree. This year it was over at Santander Arena. By doing that three days before, not releasing any tokens, just simply getting those ready, it saves us money, it saves us time. Number two, we've asked for moving back the deadline for absentee mail-in ballots. Right now, you can still apply for an absentee mail-in ballot seven days before the election. Apply. This year, there was no, that three-day uh, exception solely applied to the general election of 2020. I can tell you, and both commissioners, I believe, are aware of county leaders throughout the Commonwealth that had to reject multiple ballots because they came in late. And we, those are the two things we've asked for. We have agreed that there are many other areas, drop boxes are one of them, cleaning up the voter rolls is, our, is another one that need to be addressed in election reform, but we've asked, knowing how political this gets, 
for these two to be handled in a clean bill it is yet to happen. And even though we were assured we'll get this done early this year, it's possible. But like I said, there's seven weeks. We already have to make our plans based on no pre-canvassing. Is that correct, Commissioner? And I tur turned to Commissioner Barnhart because here's our action board. That is correct. But I would like to comment on the drop box. And you absolutely, absolutely can. So uh, the other two things I want to just touch on very quickly. One, uh, I said last week in relative to Crystal Kowalski's comment, uh, we need to look at this again. We, we stopped any discussion on this when the pandemic hit, and we have not picked a constable issue back. I simply explain what the problem was, and she does understand it. I think she accurately, uh, we, we will look at that again. I can tell her that without question, this is a problem across the Commonwealth. It varies depending rural versus uh, more urban areas. The problem and it is not easy to get the data because it comes from so, so many different sources and they're not all controlled by one entity. The last thing on the passenger rail, there's a big issue that has to be determined at some point. It's not been determined right now is whether or not this would be an intercity line or a commuter line. Intercity, it's kind of confusing, but it means it goes between states. So as an example, Amtrak is an inner city uh, rail line. If Amtrak was running this line, there'd be no more than two locations in Berks County, uh, probably two in uh, Montgomery, one, maybe two, but probably just one in uh, Chester County and then down uh, to Philadelphia. If it's commuter, commuter, is uh, has many more stops and is a much longer time of a run. We're nowhere near uh, that determination. So to try to outline uh, possible stations would be frankly inappropriate right now for me to try to jump into that. So that's all I have. I recognize Commissioner Kevin Barn. You open up the discussion about drop boxes. I would be remiss if I didn't make my own comment. For the purposes of a gubernatorial primary, which is certainly a, a an open position with uh, umpteen number of people already have announced they're running, as well as probably the biggest Senate race in the United States uh, with another vacancy with the retirement of uh, Senator Pat Toomey. But I want to explain to the public some of the information we received uh, from Chester County. Now, we were approached by the Berks County Democratic Party who took it upon themselves to contact some of the libraries and ask if they would be willing to have drop boxes at the, at the libraries. It goes a lot deeper than that. And I did forward all of our information, our, our, our comments, our information from Chester County, where we, we gathered this information. Uh, they had 13 drop boxes. They were all experimenting on this. Three were 24-7. Uh, basically with a camera on the box and a camera that would read license plates. Now let's let's start to add the numbers up here, you know, cameras. The other 10 were not manned by librarians. They were manned by temporary employment staff at $28 an hour. Two people at each library stood out front for three weeks, including all the equipment and the necessary things they needed. They also impaneled the deputy sheriffs to, to bring the ballots back from the boxes. All to say this, that for three weeks, they collected 9,000 ballots at 13 locations. And I did a cost roll up. It cost about $10 a ballot in Chester County to put a ballot drop box in Chester County. So I obviously I'm a, I'm a fiscal person. I'm responsible just like my colleagues are to manage the budget of the county. Uh, you can't pull this out of thin air and say, hey, this is a thing. The libraries are not responsible. They, that, that's the, the key takeaway from this is this is not a librarian watching a Dropbox. Because to Commissioner Linebox's point, they're, they're, they're kind of silent on whether they're 
legal or what have you, but there's a critical element and you only are allowed to or permitted to put your own ballot in that box. So I have a hard time understanding how these remote camera operated 24 seven boxes and even two temporary employees staying alive really are really interested in the integrity of the vote. Uh, again, I support the the review and come back to the board with recommendations on the cost and where these potential additional boxes could be. Hopefully my colleagues may have a change of heart before the primary of next year. I always hold out hope that they might have a change of heart. But I do believe that at least for the primary of next year, we need to expand. And then of course you look at the next presidential election uh, and the 70 plus percent of the people that, well, but but looking down the road, it's sure the, uh, uh, the election board is, do you look at a satellite office? To, I mean, it, it was an absolute madhouse at the services center trying to accommodate people who came in to apply to register and then turn around and say, well, I have a mail-in ballot to complete. It was utter chaos. We don't have the square, the square footage there. We don't have the space. We quite honestly are proud right now today we have six employees. Uh, this is a monumental task. And... I, I say to people time and time again, there's a reason why they call it a mail-in ballot. My wife and I have used mail-in ballot each of the times we were eligible to do it. Guess what happened to it? Put it in our mailbox out front and guess where it got to? It got to election services and they, re they recorded our vote. So I take pride in the fact that it's a mail-in ballot, that you do have a mailbox in front of your house or you can drop it in the mail and Ironically, they get to their destination. So for the people that wait for the last minute, uh, I apply, and as soon as I, I turn around and, and put it back in the mailbox. So I encourage people from last year and the year before, it's a mail-in ballot. It has a purpose. If you can't make it to the polls, then drop it in the mail. Don't wait for the last minute and say, oh, gee, I changed my mind. I want to go to the polls. Now what do I do with this? It's not, it, if you apply for a mail-in ballot and fill the, fill the thing out, don't make this judgment call that I forgot it on my dining room table for the last three weeks. That basically screws up the system. So thank you for letting me uh, make my comments about the drop boxes. Thank you very much, Commissioner Barn. Any comments, Commissioner? You don't have to. I no, just. Good. Yeah, both of you have covered it all. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you for taking the time to come out on a Thursday night. Um, Thursday night football is already started for those that care about Thursday night football. Uh, I'm sure this was much more exciting, uh, but seriously, this is much more important. There's nothing quite as important as local government, whether it's township, municipalities, boroughs, uh, or county government. That's the government that touches our lives virtually every day. And I'll close with this. I've shared this with a number of people in recent years. When I first ran to be a commissioner, I thought I knew what county government was about. More I didn't know than I did know, but I became a fan of county government because I saw for the first time, I was able to actually make a difference in the lives of people in my community. And I used to think maybe I'll run for some higher office. I've come to the conclusion that local government is the higher office. It's the place we do this. This is the place we are able to help our neighbors and help people at the local level. And I will tell you, I love it. There's things about it I don't always like, uh, but I love the opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. And let me tell you, both of these gentlemen do the same thing. He's new, Michael's new. We do blame him for the pandemic because it never happened. It didn't happen before. It happened since he's been here. But I and everything watched, else also. So. Yeah, everything else too. <laughs> But seriously, I've watched these men and Kevin and I have served for 14 years, go out and look for the opportunities to make a difference in people's lives. That's, that's what I love. And I am so thankful that we started to do this. Uh, my only regret is that we didn't start this 10 years ago. 
but we started it now. I don't think it's going to stop. Uh, I look forward to the Uhlenberg Township uh, next quarter. So thank you very much. Thank you, S team. Remember, as you exit, please exit uh, through this side, and the restrooms are uh, in the back on your left as you prepare to exit. With that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Second. The meeting is adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.